everyone, I'm Amanda from Pikes Peak Library District, and I love plants. Welcome to my jungle. I have a lot of plants here. It's going to be kind of hard to see all of them because I do have the sunlight behind them, which they love. This makes it a little bit harder to see, but I'm here to talk to you today about bringing plants inside. So obviously plants grow outside and they do really well out there, but what if we really want to bring these plants inside and take care of them and kind of keep them as pets? Well, we can do that if we um, have enough understanding of the kind of conditions that plants live in outside and if we can recreate those inside. So if you want to have your own plants inside and you want to take care of them and make sure that they're really happy and they grow well, the first thing you're going to have to do is research your plants. So if you know the type of plant you have or that you want to have, start off by doing research and learning about the different conditions it likes to live in. There's a lot of different conditions that plants will thrive in or not be so happy in, so it's important to know all of these. Um, so our biggest one is going to be light. There are different levels of light that plants can survive in. There are some that require high light. That means a lot of bright, direct sunlight. That's gonna be things like cactuses and succulents because their natural habitat is something like the desert where they have bright sunshine all the time. So if we wanna have some plants like these in our house, it's important that we have a window that has a lot of bright sunlight that can feed those plants in enough light. Some plants also can survive on medium light and that's gonna be like a lot of sunshine, but not direct sunshine. So enough bright light that will feed the plant, but it's not gonna be too bright. And some plants can even survive on low light. Um, and that's not necessarily like living in the dark, but it's gonna be more like it can live in an office where it doesn't have any windows, but there's enough light bulbs that are on all the time to give that plant enough light. The big condition that you're gonna to have to know what's right for your plant is water. Some plants need a little bit of water and some plants need a lot of water. And it's really important to know what your plant needs because giving it not enough water or too much water can kill it. So plants like cactuses, cacti, and succulents don't need that much water. Um, so some of them you can water once a week or even once a month. Um, but some plants, like tropical plants, need a lot of water. Sometimes they have to be consistently moist. Their soil has to always be a little bit wet, otherwise they won't survive. So that's another really big thing to research when you're um, um, deciding how to take care of your plant. Some plants even need uh, moisture in the air, which is humidity. So also look into that. Sometimes we have to keep a humidifier going to make sure that our air is moist enough to keep our plants alive. But some plants don't do well with this. So if you have a mixture of plants, make sure you keep an eye on them and make sure that it's not too moist. So if you have a bunch of tropical plants in your room that need a humidifier to keep them um, humid, make sure that it's not going to affect your succulents that don't need that humidity because too much humidity can also hurt them as well. Um, a little bit less of an important thing, but still something to keep in mind is the temperature at which you keep your plants. If you have your plants inside, they're most likely going to be okay because most plants can survive a good range of temperatures um, between like 50 and 80 degrees. Um, but keep that in mind if you have plants that are outside, if it gets too cold outside, you want to bring them in. And also consider maybe keeping them away from win windows in the winter if those windows get too cold. Or keep them away from the heater in the winter because sometimes that heat can be too much for the plants too. Um, another big thing um, about taking care of your plants is the kind of soil that they're in. So there's different kinds of soil that's made up of different types, um, types of dirt and rocks and different kind of fertilizer, which is like food for your plants. Some plants need a soil that drains really well. That would be like cactuses or cacti or succulents that don't need a lot of water. So they need soil where the water can go through it and drain really easily. But some of those tropical plants who need to make sure that their soil is consistently moist need a different kind of soil that's going to have um, uh, less draining so all that water can stay in. It's also important to think about the fertilizer that's in your soil because your plants don't just need sunlight and water, but they also need food, which is fertilizer. So that'll come in the soil. And over time, they'll eat up all of that food and you'll have to replace the soil. So make sure that you keep an eye about um, re re repotting your plants in new soil every now and then. Pots are also really important. It's important to think about um, if they have a drainage hole, if your plants um, need to make sure that they don't have that much water in there so the soil can drain out of it. 
It's also important to think about the type of material your pots are made out of. If you have um, succulents or cacti that don't need a lot of water, if you put them in a terracotta pot or a ceramic pot, these pots can actually absor absorb some of the moisture, which is better for the plant since it doesn't want to be moist all the time. Um, it's also important to think about the size of your pot. Research um, a little bit about how the roots like to grow. Some plants like to be very root bound, which means that they like to have a lot of roots and be all squished together in a tiny pot. But some plants need a lot of space for the roots to spread out because they don't like that. So research about the pot size that you need as well. Sometimes you need something really small and sometimes you need something really big. Um, you can also think about if some of your plants are going to be trailing plants. That means that when they grow, they start to dangle down, like this guy is starting to do. See, he's starting to fall a little bit. So if, if once he starts getting bigger, these can fall for several feet. They can trail down to the floor. So we can also think about getting pots that we can hang so that those um, trails can do that. They can hang all the way down. Um, other things to consider is pruning your plants. So that means if they start getting leaves that aren't doing so well, they're either unhealthy or they're dying. If you cut those off, then it actually is better for the plant. Um, because while they're still attached, the plant is still trying to feed those sick or dead leaves and is wasting some of its energy doing that. So if we cut off some of the dead leaves or the leaves that are injured, um, it'll stop sending its energy there and it'll send it to the rest of the plant so that the plant the rest of the plant can get healthier and can grow faster. Um, sometimes we can cut off parts of the plants that are healthy and we can propagate them. That means that we're taking pieces of an already grown plant and we're growing it into an entirely new plant. This is one of my favorite things to do. Let me grab an example. So some of the easier plants to propagate are succulents because they have leaves that will fall off and those leaves can grow entirely new plants. So I have several different kinds of succulents here. This one here that's hanging out is called a ghost plant and all these little leaves will fall off when they're ready and they're done growing. When they fall off, I can just set them in the soil and they actually grow whole new plants. There's a bunch of whole new ones right here. These all came from just little leaves that fell off of this guy over here. I also have this succulent here and some of these leaves I've actually pulled off and if you pull them off gently and if they stay intact, you can do the same thing. You let those leaves sit on top of the soil and over time, they start to grow entirely new plants. So this right here is a leaf that I pulled off of that flower I just showed you and it's already growing a whole new flower there. Um, it already has roots that are setting in as well. So that's how you can propagate succulents. But you can propagate other types of plants as well. So. Um, a pothos is a type of trailing plant, like that one I showed you earlier. It's really easy to take care of. They're pretty resilient. But you can propagate them by cutting them. So if you cut off a piece of this plant that has multiple leaves growing on it, it's pretty easy to put them in water and let them root, and then you can plant them again. So if you took a piece of this and cut it maybe about here, where there's three leaves growing off of it, you would place it in water like this, and roots would start to grow. So this is kind of hard to see here. So I have a couple of cuttings in here and it has a couple leaves on it and then there's roots growing off of it. And if you keep it in water long enough and you make sure that this water stays clean and refreshed, it'll grow enough roots to where you can plant it. So that's what I've done here. These guys were a pothos cutting I cut from a bigger plant. I water rooted it and then when it was ready I put it in soil and now it's growing in a pot. And eventually it'll get big and I can keep doing the same thing with this guy as well. I think it's really fun to watch the roots grow. This is called a purple passion plant and he grows roots really fast and really big roots in there so you can see those growing in there. He's kind of fun too. So um, this is a really fun way to keep growing more of your plants. Just a few other things to think about when you have house plants. Um, think about pests. So Plants can get infected or they can get different kind of bugs that will hurt them or kill them. So just make sure you keep an eye on your plants make sure they aren't getting any pests. If they are, just do a little bit of research and usually there's a way that you can um, clean those up, clear it up, and those plants will be just fine. You probably want to quarantine them so if you have one sick plant, take it away from all the rest of your plants so the others don't get sick because it can spread. Um, a couple other things to think about. Um, 
a lot of plants can actually be poisonous. So usually that's not a big deal because we're not usually eating our house plants, right? But what if we have pets like dogs or cats or even younger siblings who might get into those plants? That's another really good thing to research. And if you do have some more poisonous plants, you can keep them up high where nobody can, um, can get them. Um, so if you are interested in starting your own little house jungle like mine, there's a couple of plants that you might want to look into that are easy to take care of. One is the pothos plant, which was like this guy, and they can get really big. This one still isn't very big. It's just the biggest one I have. But they're really easy to take care of because they can grow in high light or low light, and they are pretty resilient about how much water you give them. Um, a couple other easy ones are spider plants. Let's take a look at a couple of mine. That's like this guy up here, and I have another one over there. They're pretty easy to take care of because same thing, they'll take low light or high light, and they also um, can be pretty resilient to how much you water them. Um, another easy plant is a snake plant, and there's lots of different varieties of these plants too. This is a bird's nest snake plant. So you can see they're really cool. They have all these stripy colors. But these ones are pretty resi resilient as well. Even if you overwater them, which mine has the roots rot, they can still survive and you can replant them and eventually the roots will grow back if you're planting them the right way. Um, this one is also pretty easy to grow. This one is called a money tree or an umbrella tree. Um, so these ones are pretty easy. You can just take one of those cuttings off of a bigger plant and just stick it in water or soil and those roots will grow. Another easy plant um, is called a ZZ plant, and I have one back here. It's hard to get to, so I'm not going to pull it out. But they're they're pretty resilient, and they're known as one of the best plants um, for beginners because they can survive in almost any light, and they can handle underwatering and overwatering really well. But they are poisonous, so if your pets eat them, that's not very good. And even if you handle them with your bare hands, it's good to wash your hands right away um, to make sure that you don't get any kind of rash or any other kind of side effect from that. So no matter what plant you get, make sure you do your research um, and your plants will be happy as long as you're uh, taking care of them the way they need to be. So I hope you enjoyed and I hope that you start your own house jungle. Bye! My name is Athena and I'm going to teach you how to make seed bombs. Have you noticed any spring flowers popping up outside your windows yet? If you have, pollinators won't be far behind. Pollinators, like bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds, transfer pollen between plants as they stop to feed on flower nectar. Without pollinators to do this important job, we wouldn't be able to eat many of the foods that we enjoy. Things like berries, tomatoes, and even squash. Could you imagine a life without pumpkin pie? So to help out our local pollinators, we are going to plant some of the things that they like best, wildflowers. Let's get started. To make your seed bombs, you'll need wildflower seeds that are native to your area and a seed bomb matrix. If you want to make your own, the recipe is three parts potter's clay to five parts compost, and you'll mix it with just enough water to hold it together. And that's one way to make a seed bomb. Since we don't get a lot of rain here, we're going to do one other kind of seed bomb as well that might work a little bit better in our climate. For this, we're going to make a ball of just the seed bomb matrix. And then we're going to take a pinch of our seeds and press them in to the outside of our seed bomb. This kind works a little bit better where there's less rain because it doesn't need water to break it apart. All right, and those are two ways to make a seed bomb. Happy planting. Let's get back to nature by starting seeds inside your home today. 
Do you enjoy a bean and rice burrito for lunch? Or perhaps a hot, steamy bowl of chili on a cold, frosty Colorado night? Hi, I'm Tina. Did you know that beans grow all over our world? Beans are delicious and they're healthy and cost very little money to buy. Beans are a great source of vegetarian protein with vitamins, minerals, and fiber to keep us healthy. This makes them an important crop for all of us to grow. It's easy to start your own bean plant that you can harvest and cook and serve to your family as a fun, delicious meal from just a few humble beans. You may even have these beans in your kitchen right now. These are pinto beans, um, but you can use a take and make kit from Pikes Peak Library District location to start this with everything you need as well too. So make sure to pick one up from homeschool take and make kits. It's easy to grow your own bean plant that you can harvest and cook and serve. And remember, we can use the common Colorado bean crop, pinto beans. Some Colorado pride there. These are the majority of dry beans that are Colorado grown. You may also have seen or maybe even enjoyed navy beans, northern beans, there is even Anasazi. And Anasazi are a special kind of bean that's grown in the southwest corner of our state and is very popular there. Whether using the fresh beans or these dried beans, beans do make up one of the most important and oldest food crop. Can you guess how long ago we were enjoying beans? It's 9,000 years ago were the first findings of beans being used as a food source. Pretty cool from this tiny little humble bean. <laughs> Let's give these beans their very first home by starting with just a little bit of water. <laughs> Then you'll be able to watch what's going to happen inside your bean seed as it starts to grow or germinate. Watching a sprout merge from a dry seed is nothing short of miraculous. And you'll get to maybe even watch as the roots emerge and these beautiful green leaves start popping out too. It's gonna be lots of fun. So let's take a look at what's included inside your homeschool take and make kit to start these beans growing. And at the same time, you'll be performing two science experiments. Let's take a look at what you'll find inside our take and make homeschool kit for your two experiments. One, two zipper bags, 10 uncooked beans, one, two paper towels, a data sheet for light experiment, a data sheet for dark experiment with your scientific method on the back and a fun bean house craft for you to do. To make a house for your beans to germinate, first cut the paper towel to size of your plastic bag have a bowl of water ready to get your paper towel wet, but not too wet. Be sure to wring it out. Place the wet paper towel carefully on the bottom of the plastic Ziploc bag. Zip closed carefully. Make sure it's shut tight so none of the water can evaporate. Write the date on your scrap paper. You can also write if this is the light or dark experiment on your bag. If you would like to create a beanhouse craft, first get started 
by using your crayons or markers to color in your own bean house. <laughs> then cut out carefully with scissors, tape the bean bag to the bean house, and lastly, tape your bean house craft with your beans to a sunny window to create a cozy home for your beans to grow.